All right, now we should be cooking with a non-renewable fossil fuel. So that's good. Okay, also known as gas. All right, so how in the world do we call that other angle up there? So some of you weren't happy when if I just said sine inverse x. So let's just use algebra. That makes most people happy or unhappy, but we trust it. So one of the identities, how do we go from cosine to sine? One of them, not used all that frequently, was this guy. And I could rewrite the other way around as sine uh, pi over 2 minus theta equals cos theta. So this is one of the 8,000 identities that we came up with in pre-calculus. So where is the pi over 2 minus theta angle? So if this angle, the standard angle right here that we measure is theta, the pi over 2 minus theta is start at pi over 2 and then come back that much. So this angle right here that I labeled is, it's pointing the wrong way, but it's basically uh, pi over 2 minus theta. So <clears throat> how do I get to that angle? It's going to be uh, sine inverse right there. So that'll be sine inverse x. Yeah. So that angle will be sine inverse x. So if we add up cos inverse x plus sine inverse x, we'll get pi over 2. So we add those two together, we'll be all the way at the top, pi over 2. All right, that is our first pi over two, yeah. So that's one of our identities. Another one we're gonna get. So there's x, here is negative x. Didn't do very much, just make x negative, you'd be over there. And we can, oh geez. <laughs> That was pretty bad. How to not make a triangle. There we go. All right, so that's the point of the unit circle for, now I'm not measuring the negative angle, I'm taking an x-coordinate and making it negative. So but the point of the unit circle is gonna be over there. So if I measure the angle in the standard way, go this way, it's gonna be really similar, except this is cos inverse of negative x is how we can get that angle. So that's cos inverse negative x is that bigger angle I just drew. Cos inverse negative x, all right. What is another name for this angle that I just drew? So to go from that cos inverse negative x that little bit more. That's the same as cos inverse x right there. Just bringing it over. So I can call this little angle here cos inverse cos cos inverse regular x. That's the little angle here. So now you can see go cos inverse negative x and then cos inverse x, you get pi right there. That'll take you halfway around. So our next cos inverse x plus cos inverse negative x equals regular pi. So that's another one right there. Uh, I'm going to solve for cos inverse negative x just by subtracting cos inverse x the other side. So cos inverse negative x equals uh, pi minus cos inverse x. OK. So that's an identity we have there. What else do we need? Uh, 
It depends on what you're doing. This is sort of the, um, it's not quite even or odd, but sort of the even odd property. Like what happens if I plug in negative x? I can rewrite it like that. So it's not even or odd, it's, but it's sort of like that property. So if I plug in negative x, I can rewrite it like this. If it was even or odd, it would be plus or minus cos regular x, but the extra pi is in there, so it's not, not even or odd. It would be neither. All right, so my notes I have a triangle written out, which we'll probably like a lot more. So we can do something very similar on a triangle, a right triangle, of course. So if I call this x and we're on a unit, um, now it's a little weird to call the vertical side x. So if I label this angle as theta, easy question. What trig function relates theta one and x? So, Almost X. sine, because x is where y normally would be. So we're going to go uh, uh, opposite and hypotenuse. So we go sine theta equals x over one. It's a little strange to see x hanging out right there in the sine, but to solve for theta, theta equals sine inverse x. All right, so we got sine inverse x there. <coughs> Think about the angle at the very top. We'll call it phi. How can I relate phi with 1 and x? And we want to think Sogatoa. We have an adjacent and a hypotenuse. So cosine theta, uh, cosine phi equals x over 1. So cos phi equals x over 1. Oh, no. Oh, geez. Phi equals cos inverse x is what I want. All right. Now from here, you add up, you can add up the two angles plus pi over two, and you get pi. This is the angle sum property. Sum of the angles is 180 degrees, also known as pi. So if I add up all three angles, I get pi. This is from angle sum, sine inverse x plus cos inverse x plus pi over two equals pi. And then just subtract pi over two. Sine inverse x plus cos inverse x equals pi minus pi over 2 is pi over 2. All right, there's another way to get um, sine and cosine inverse related right there. Slightly different way. So if I solve for cos inverse x, I can write it as pi over 2 minus sine inverse x. So I will box the two more useful ones. So now we'll look at tangent and cotangent. So the other more useful one was the cos inverse x equals pi minus cos inverse x or cos inverse negative x equals pi minus cos inverse x. All right, we'll go for tangent inverse now. So we'll let y equal tan inverse x. If we flip this around, we can write it as tan y equals x. Uh, y has to be, when you go tan inverse, you have to limit, I like to think about the limiting the domain of the tangent function when I think about the inverse, as opposed to thinking about the range of the tangent inverse. So what does the original tangent function look like? Here's the original tangent graph. I'm only drawing one period. 
because we have to chop up the domain to force it to be one to one. So we got one period of our tangent function. So we're going from negative pi over two to positive pi over two. All right, so that was our original domain of the tangent function, which means y needs to be between negative pi over two and positive pi over two. There was our chopped up domain that we had to restrict to. And the same thing for uh, cotangent and cosecant and secant. So we'll just rewrite these. Uh, if y equals coat inverse x, that's the same thing as coat y equals x. Cotangent has slightly different. Uh, chopped up domain. It went from zero to pi. Is that right for cotangent? I think so. It's been a while. It's been a while. All right. That seems right. Old. Vertical asymptotes become x-intercepts, and all x-intercepts become vertical asymptotes. And then you can look at the point with a y value of 1 is going to stay where it is when you do the reciprocal graph. Like reciprocal 1 is 1 over 1. So 1 and negative 1 stay where they are. All right, so here y has to be in the open interval 0 pi. And we can do secant and cosecant. We'll start out with y equals secant inverse x. Change that around. That is secant y equals x. And of course, we need to restrict. So y is one, uh, secant is 1 over cosine. So we could look back at our cosine somewhere. What did our cosine need? Negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. Now, to be a little careful, it's going to be open. Our original, here's our original cosine graph. We're all okay with this graph where we went 0 to pi. Oh, no. Scratch that part out, scratch that part out. So cosine was okay 0 to pi. However, the reciprocal, for secant, Oh, I'm totally messing this one up. We better just graph it out really fast. All right, so 1 over cosine, so the cosine graph looks like this. So that'll be minus pi to pi, one full period. When we graph the, co, uh, the reciprocal, we're going to turn x-intercepts into vertical asymptotes, and then our graph preserves the y value of 1. So the one period of secant looks like this. It looks sort of like a parabola, but definitely not actually a parabola because it doesn't go forever in both directions. So we have that. And you can't use negative pi over 2 or pi over 2 because you'd be dividing by 0. All right, so that would be secant right there. And now we'll do the same thing for cosecant. Actually, let's mess around with some algebra first. All right, so we have secant y equals x. What we're going to do is write secant. Instead of secant, we'll write it as 1 over cosine now. So that's what secant is. Which pen is better? I know it depends on what zoom level I use. 
but sometimes I think the darker one's a little better. Okay. So we have one over cos y. Now I'm going to take the reciprocal of both sides right there. So we take the reciprocal on both sides of the equation, and then we're going to uncosine both sides. So we're going to take cos inverse on both sides. So we get y equals cos inverse 1 over x. So if we started, we started here with y equals secant inverse, and then uh, eventually solve for y in a sort of roundabout way. So we get, these are the same y's that we're using, so we get secant inverse x equals cos inverse 1 over x. So that is how secant inverse and cosine inverse are related. My handwriting looks a lot neater with the big pen too. All right, so that is secant inverse cos and cos inverse related. What you don't want to, so you can put these in your notes uh, or in your cheat sheet, but you won't need most of them. Uh, this is the most common mistake I see. is a reciprocal written like this. It seems like that's how it should be, because if we were dealing with the regular secant and regular cosine, this is how they'd be related. All right? So this is not a identity like this. So it's sort of your intuition tells you it should be this, but it's not. There's a reciprocal happening, but it is sort of outside the function. It's on the other side of the function. And now we're going to play the same game with cosecant. So we do have a slight issue, which is the board space is limited. So when I start panning or scrolling down, you lose stuff very quickly. So like if I just do this, that would be really bad. So what I'm going to try to do is scroll a little bit at a time. So I'm maybe writing in the bottom half of uh, of this, and I'll maybe I'll write more horizontal math instead of more vertical math. So that was secant. So we're going to do something really similar for cosecant. And we started out with y equals secant inverse, so we'll begin with y equals cosecant inverse. Flipping the, inverting the function, cosecant y equals x. Really fast graph of cosecant. Well, the bonus is I'll never be in your way. I'll never obstruct the view, even though I can't see half of the page right now. There's a reciprocal of sine. So we're starting with a sine. We'll just pick that period right there. So that's pi over 2, negative pi over 2. Uh, pi, and I'm kind of running out of room, but I'll just switch to blue and it'll be fine. And our zeros turn into uh, vertical asymptotes, so we're going to have vertical asymptotes there, and the part we're going to use Oh, this is really bad. Why is this part that I picked to restrict to really the wrong part? What does an inverse function need to have, or a function you have to have an inverse? I picked, it's a nice part of the graph, but the property it doesn't have is one to one. So I picked, it's a, it's, if I was picking one chunk of the graph, 
just for a nice chunk, I would have picked this one. But I picked the part that is not one to one. That is not good. We can also go back as far as we want on the notes, which is nice. You can't do that when you're erasing the board. All right, so let's pick the correct part of this. All right, you always want zero or x coordinate zero. So we definitely want to choose that part right there. So we definitely want that part. Uh, there's another part of the secant graph right here. I can choose that part as well. Because now, unfortunately, it's two separate intervals. But I still get the property that is one to one in those separate intervals. All right, so you need to ask questions if you're wondering what's going on. So you erase y as an element of? I'm going to change the interval that we're going to be picking from. So secant and cosecant have to be part of the same interval? They have to be. the So we're restricting domains of the, we're restricting the domain of secant right now to force it to be one to one. Like all these trig functions are very not one to one. So we have to cut them up into small piece, like just like a very small piece to have one to one. So I'm picking sort of the biggest interval I can choose that is one to one. And the original interval I chose had a, a parabola type shape, which was very not one to one. Like I originally had this U shape up here. Can you see that little dot on the screen? Yeah, that U shape right there. And that part is very not, that makes it not one to one. Like fails horizontal line test. So if I pick the right part of the parabola shape, I can't pick the left. So I pick the right part. I can go even further and get some of the next curve down there. I can only get half of that next curve, though. I can't get, if I start to pick this sort of part going down again, I fail being one to one. So. Except you have to skip pi over 2, because that's a vertical asymptote. So I do have to skip the vertical asymptote. So we go closed 0, open pi over 2, union pi over 2 to pi, closed at pi. All right. I will not ask you to graph the inverse functions. So most of this stuff, you just sort of have to nod and be sort of okay with. You don't have to understand all of what I'm doing. I should understand most of what I'm doing, but you do not have to. All right, so we fixed our interval. This also means when you graph the inverse function, there's two pieces that are not connected anymore. So there's like two parts of the graph. And now we're going to go down to the cosecant. We're going to be way more careful this time, and we're going to choose so we're at pi over 2. I'm going to choose the left part of this here because I want to get closer to 0. I want to get right around 0. So instead of going with the right part, I'm going to go with the left part. Now we're going to change the place we're going to look. We're going to look at the upside down parabola to the left. And we're going to go with uh, this part of the graph right there. So our restricted domain is negative pi over 2, comma, open at 0, union 0, positive pi over 2. So at this point, you should be wondering, why are we doing all this? So we're going to be able to do a little bit of calculus on uh, some of these inverse trig functions and then use the algebraic relationships to really avoid doing calculus on all of them. So we're going to do some calculus and then use these algebra formulas to 
Uh, for example, if we look at seek inverse x equals cos inverse 1 over x, uh, we could take derivative of both sides and we could kind of avoid doing some of the calculations for uh, derivatives. All right, so we're going to do the same thing we did uh, with secant. We're going to do it for cosecant. So we're going to solve for y in the equation cosecant y equals x. So step one, we're going to write it as, now I, of course I could solve it by taking cosecant inverse of both sides, but that's where we started, so it won't be anywhere interesting. So we're going to write cosecant y as 1 over sine y equals x. So replace cosecant by 1 over sine. Reciprocal both sides, sine y equals 1 over x. And now take sine inverse. of both sides. So we get sine inverse 1 over x equals y. And now we can relate cosecant inverse x equals sine inverse 1 over x. We're just going to use algebraic identities, basically. I just wanted to show you where they come from instead of just saying, oh, cosecant inverse x equals sine inverse 1 over x, because I said so. Um, so we did a whole lot of the inverse trig derivatives already. And I'm pretty sure we did sine. And if we didn't do sine, we did cosine. We certainly did one of those two, for sure. One of the two uh, inverse derivatives. So just really fast recap, this will be 1 over f is f inverse is sine inverse, so regular f is regular sine. So this is going to be 1 over f prime of f inverse of x. That's just the uh, inverse, anti, uh, inverse derivative formula. And what is f prime? Cos. I'm being incredibly lazy not writing of x, of x, of x, of x, of x. So I'm sort of skipping the of x part. Now this will be 1 over f prime. So it's cos of uh, f inverse, which is sine inverse inverse x. And without doing all that trig, that is square root 1 minus x squared. So I should have made you do enough of that in week one that I don't need to do all that stuff right now. So if that's unfamiliar, uh, make sure you can simplify cos of sine inverse of x down to that square root. So every derivative that we write down, we get an antiderivative. So just writing down the derivative in one spot. We get a free antiderivative. So I'm going to move the derivative operator to the other side with an inverse, also known as an integral. So I'm going to move the derivative to the other side. So we get sine inverse x equals antiderivative 1 over square root 1 minus x squared dx. And I need a plus c, which I don't have room to squeeze it in, so I'll just go plus c right there when I have an antiderivative. I'm going to change everything into u's, so just replace x by u, which is normally a useless u substitution, but it is better to remember it that way so that your brain is thinking about u substitution. So we get integral 1 over square root 1 minus u squared du. And then I'm going to write the uh, antiderivative on the other side, sine inverse u plus c. Now 
I don't remember if I wrote down the antiderivatives corresponding to those initial trig, inverse trig derivatives. So I don't think I did. So I'm going to go through all six right now. So I'm not going to go through the full derivation of the, you know, simplification of the trig, but I am going to write down all the derivatives and then all the antiderivatives we get. For, and these are for all the inverse trig functions. Uh, there is a slight restriction on what u is allowed to be. Just looking at 1 minus u squared, what happens if u is plus or minus 1? It would be dividing by 0, so that's not okay. What happens if u is something like 2, positive 2? Square root of negative stuff. So we need to keep it real not complex or imaginary, so we need to make sure that u is not big. So it needs to be smaller than 1 uh, and bigger than negative 1, so we are going to write all that together and just say absolute value has to be less than 1. And then I'll keep it close to 1, and so when we write 1 minus u squared, that'll ensure that that is a positive uh, value. So the way to think about this is u is small. That's a good way to think about this. So 1 minus a small positive quantity is going to be positive. 1 minus a big positive quantity would be negative. All right, that takes care of sine inverse. All right, easy example for you to do. Just a tiny bit of chain rule. Derivative sine inverse x cubed. Chain rule questions. You can simplify x cubed squared x to the sixth, but depending on what you're doing, that may or may not be useful. So I'm not going to spend too much time simplifying, changing algebra forms around uh, once we take our derivative. All right. So no questions on that? Go with the chain rule. This is your chance to be infamous by pointing out mistakes. In 40 years, you can go watch this video. Be like, I got him. So we're going to do the same thing for cosine inverse x. Same thing being we're going to take a derivative. But instead of using the inverse derivative formula, Yes, you know, 1 over f prime f inverse of x. We could do that, simplify down, trig, blah, blah, blah. What I'm going to do instead, we did all that painful trig for a purpose. It's going to pay off right now. So how can I rewrite cos inverse x? It's pi over 2 minus sine inverse x. So we're going to make that algebraic substitution. So we spent all that time somewhere up here. Hopefully it's inside of a box and I can point to it super fast. There we go. Cos inverse x equals pi over 2 minus sine inverse x. Came from the angle sum. Must be true. All right, so I'm going to use that. And you can always do algebra before or after or during. Well, you don't really want to do it during calculus unless you're a calculus expert. But you can always do algebra first. So I'm going to do that algebra substitution right now. So this is pi over 2 minus sine inverse x. 
And what's the root of a sine inverse x? We just did that work and simplified it right up above. So we want the root of the sine inverse x. That's right up there at the top of the screen. So we got that. We just have to do the uh, derivative of a constant is 0 minus 1 over square root 1 minus x squared. So summarizing, we get negative 1 over square root 1 minus x squared. All right, that was way faster. We did have to spend a lot of time doing some trig, some inverse trig, really, but we got to save a lot of time right there, a whole lot of time. So any questions on that? All right, up next. Oh, we got to get our antiderivative formula before we do anything else. So we're going to move the derivative operator to the other side with the antiderivative. So I'm going to write it as c plus cos inverse x equals integral negative 1 over square root 1 minus x squared dx. So I just change it from a derivative to an antiderivative. And now we'll rewrite in terms of u's. So we'll have integral. I'm going to write the negative outside the integral, 1 over square root 1 minus u squared du equals cos inverse u plus c. Let's go ahead and multiply by negative 1, move the negative to the side without the integral. So we get negative cos inverse u. You could write minus c, but c is just a constant, so minus c is also a constant. So if we look at these two antiderivative formulas, and we also have to make sure u doesn't make us divide by 0 or get an imaginary number, so it can't be very big. What did we gain, or did we gain anything off of these two antiderivative formulas that are on the board? Is there anything I could integrate with this cos inverse u? antiderivative at the bottom that I couldn't just use the top one for. They start at the same form, exactly the same form. So the second one here, cos inverse u, this doesn't give me anything additional. So if you have an integral of 1 over square root 1 minus u squared, just go with the sine inverse as opposed to the negative cos inverse antiderivative. So this antiderivative down here doesn't is extraneous. You don't need it. It doesn't give you anything additional. So that'll be extraneous. Uh, I would not even write it on your cheat sheet. So I generally don't tell you things are useless unless they really are. So you don't need that second antiderivative at all. Uh, you do need, however, this original derivative of cos inverse. That one could be useful. So that cos inverse derivative could be useful. But antiderivative, not so much. So I would not put that on your uh, cheat sheet. Save, save room for other stuff. All right, tangent inverse time. Okay. 
So f inverse is tangent inverse. Regular f is tangent. f prime derivative tangent is secant squared. So just writing the inverse, which is tangent, which is tan inverse, the regular function, which is tangent, and then f prime, which, which is secant squared. So now we're going to line this up, 1 over f prime of f inverse of x is 1 over f prime secant squared of tan inverse x. Uh, which you can write, let's see. I always go the triangle geometry route. Let's go algebra route this time and switch it up. So I usually draw it a triangle to simplify my trig. Uh, so we're going to let, just looking at the tangent inverse x, let theta equal tan inverse x. So tan theta equals x. Rewriting secant squared. So we're going to do all of our simplifications right in this area. So now secant squared of tan inverse x is secant squared theta. Secant squared is 1 minus tangent squared. No. Oh, no. Let's get this right. Tangent squared plus 1 is secant squared. So secant squared theta is 1 plus tangent squared. There we go. Tangent squared theta. And theta was tangent inverse x. Now here is where the exponential notation of trig functions is extra tricky. So I'm going to rewrite it with the better exponential notation. So we have tangent squared, which means tangent of that stuff times tangent of that stuff. So a better way to write it is 1 plus parentheses tangent of tangent inverse x and then that stuff squared. So that's really what the square means, like square the output of tangent like that. All right, easy question. What is tangent of tangent inverse of x? x. That's what inverse functions do. So it's 1 plus x squared. All right. So that is the denominator. All right, writing down, just summarizing this, d over dx tangent inverse x equals 1 over 1 plus x squared. All right, it's a good place to stop. We'll obviously write, rewrite this with an antiderivative.